A few gaunt columns rise majestically from an encroaching wilderness and to become for a moment stark monuments to a vanished era. For there was a time when cotton was king and the plantation reflected a way of life peculiar to the South. But those golden times have gone now and with them the great plantation. All that remain are a few once lovely columns set against the sky. plantation system can be said to have begun with the cultivation of tobacco. Tobacco flourished, and with it the trade between England and the southern colonies. Along the rivers, great homes were built, testifying to the wealth and influence of these early colonial planters. The tone of society has always been truly English in Lower Virginia the Tidewater Country, as the people love to call it. It has been settled by all classes of Englishmen who aspire to imitate in the New World the customs and manners of the old. These planter homes fully expressed the taste and social standing of this small group of landed aristocrats. By the middle of the 18th century, the plantation had taken on well-defined characteristics. They were complex and self-sufficient communities. And many outbuildings housed the materials and trades necessary to the functioning of a large plantation. Tobacco sheds, warehouses, stables, dairies, kitchens, servant quarters. In effect, the plantations had come to resemble small villages. The grounds were dominated always by the master's residence, called the Great House. Like one of the patriarchs of old, I have my flock, my bondsmen and my bondswomen, and every sort of trade amongst my servants, so that I live in a kind of independence on everyone but providence. In contrast to the planter aristocrat, the majority of landowners were small farmers whose sole means of self-betterment was to settle in new areas and make large profits in tobacco. But in order to make large profits, large crops were needed. New land became a necessity. The system is such that the planter scarcely considers land as part of his permanent investment. He buys land, uses it until it's exhausted, and then sells it. It's something to be worn out, not improved. As new lands became exhausted by one crop farming, planters gradually migrated to more distant areas, always carrying with them the plantation system. Further south, along the swampy coastal regions of Georgia and among the backwaters of the Carolinas, early southern planters had discovered other money crops. There was rice and sugar cane. Negro slaves from the West Indies and Africa were acquired in increasing numbers to do the arduous work of planting and harvesting. The peculiar institution of slavery had become an integral part of the plantation system. As slavery became more entrenched, wealth became more concentrated. 
into the coastal regions flowed the profits of the numerous rice and sugar plantations. Charleston, South Carolina, epitomized the wealth and social standing of this planter class. In Charleston, the very streets and houses had an air of solidity and dignified repose. The South, near the close of the 18th century, presented a picture of a society contentedly settled in the ways of the plantation system. Such a picture was in striking contrast to England, which was rapidly being transformed by an industrial revolution. New spinning and weaving inventions had suddenly created an enormous demand for raw cotton with which to supply the textile mills of Manchester and Liverpool. But the limited supply of long stable or Indian cotton would never fill the demands of an industrialized England. If only a way could be found to remove the seeds from the short stable cotton, a variety so ideally suited for growing in vast areas of the southern United States. A way was found. In 1793, Eli Whitney invented a quick and practical way of cleaning cotton. In about 10 days, I made a little model which will clear 10 times as much cotton as any other way known. The machine consists of a wooden cylinder fitted with wire teeth, which draws the seed cotton through a wire screen that serves to separate the seed from the lint. The cotton engine, or gin as it came to be known, was the solution that England and the South had been waiting for. Overnight, as it were, cotton became king. Cotton, cotton. They talk of nothing else. From the cotton in the market, they go to the cotton in the fields. The fluctuating prices, the overtrading and so on, round to the prices and prospects of cotton again. My ears weary with the sounds of cotton, cotton. Cotton. Cotton stimulated the plantation system on a huge scale. And in the next quarter century, following the war of 1812 and the subsequent defeat of the Indians, new lands were open for settlement. And the march of cotton continued as far west as the great Mississippi. <laughs> Along the wharves of New Orleans, the steamboats gathered, loading and unloading cotton for shipment to the North and to Europe. Cotton had transformed this old French town into a thriving and populous city. The South was now producing three-fourths of the world's total cotton supply. Wealth, however, became a monopoly in the hands of a few planters, their brokers and their bankers. Who has not heard of Mississippi fortunes that sprang up like Jonah's gourd in a single night? The bulk of power and wealth is held by a tiny minority of men who have the gift of circumstance and the nerve for anything. As the cotton kingdom expanded, there was a corresponding demand for manpower to clear and work the cotton growing areas. The South turned again to the Negro who constituted an immense reservoir of ready labor. Many in the South once believed that slavery was a great moral and political evil. It is no evil, no scourge, but a great religious, social, and moral blessing. But two-thirds of the Southern white families were small farmers who had little to do with slavery. These yeoman farmers occupied the less desirable cotton-growing areas. To the north, in the Appalachians and in the southern highlands, lived the mountaineers, who were the least attached to slavery as an institution and to cotton as a means of livelihood. Inhabiting the swamp and pine barrens were the poor whites, who were at the very bottom of the social scale. Thus, out of the entire white population of the south, 
Few had any direct contact with slavery, and even fewer, less than 3%, could ever hope to become members of that minority group of planter aristocracy who were influencing the whole of Southern economy and society. These planter aristocrats ruled the South by virtue of their wealth, their upbringing and better education, and their control of political machinery. The rich planters promoted their own interests and were indirectly supported by the majority of Southerners. For the interests of all classes of Southerners were now tied together by a single economy, cotton. Plantation homes were designed in many styles, from the classic proportions of Greek revival to the rambling galleries of French provincial. There was even a special category called steamboat gothic. But nearly all plantations, regardless of style, were laid out along similar lines. They generally faced the waterway, the primary route to the outside world and its markets. The main house, which was the center of the plantation unit, was usually approached by an alley of fine old oaks. To the side were the dovecotes, and the kitchens where all the plantation meals were prepared. To the rear were the gardens, flanked usually by the bachelor quarters. Directly behind were the stables and carriage houses, and nearby were the simple slave cabins. From the verandas of the main house, the planter might survey the progress in his fields. The more prosperous the plantation, the more lavish the interiors. Associated with the plantation was an ease of living, a graciousness of manner that had become a legend throughout the South. Plantations were often separated from their neighbors by considerable distances. So it was only natural that hospitality was freely extended. Visitors from outside were often amazed to discover the respect held by planters for all things cultural. Entertaining became an accepted routine of plantation life. hot summer months, most planters would take their families and follow society to the fashionable resorts of past Christian or White Sulphur Springs. We are glad to say that much of the olden time still lingers here. The propriety of demeanor, polish of manner, courtesy and cleverness, which seems inseparable from Southern society. In the fall, they would return again to their homes and the agreeable rhythm of plantation life. All this then became part of the legend surrounding the great plantation. But there was also another side that was easily overlooked. No large plantation could function without a sufficient supply of slaves. And what of the slaves? What could be their feelings toward their masters of their life in bondage? Our Miss Sally was the sweetest, best thing in the world. She was so good and kind to everybody. She loved her slaves too. If all slaves had belonged to white folks like ours, there wouldn't have been any freedom, won't it? No, sir, he won't good to none of us. All around, hated to be bought by him, cause he was so mean. When he was too tired to whip us, he had the overseer do it. And the overseer was meaner than the master. But mister, the people was the same as they is now. There was good ones and bad ones. I just happened to belong to a bad one. With slaves as an abundant and cheap source of labor, the plantation could prosper. Without slaves, the plantation would fail. If there were many in the South who deplored the use of slave labor, or who felt that nothing could justify it in point of economy, there were equally as many 
who were ready and eager to defend it. For slavery had become a fundamental part of the plantation system, and the plantation system had become the southern way of life. There was now no turning back. A course had been set which could not be altered except by the passing of time or the clash of war.